Zombie takeout carries your blood and soul back to the genesis of my life form. Hello and welcome to episode 417 of Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1985, Life Force, our Mandela okay. Effect movie. Um, <laughs> the one we were sure we reviewed until I think I got about halfway through and I'm like, you know, I have not seen this in a very long time. <laughs> um, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by costuming. If you're making a movie, you're probably spending too much on it. And also brought to you by Strategically Placed Bars. Want to keep your rating down to an R? You're going to need a shit ton of Strategically Placed Bars. But only for some of your cast members. Yes. <laughs> Just the guy with the, the ones with the floppy bits. Mm. Not the All right, uh, I guess I'm on here. The impromptu plot summary. Um, all right, so we have um, we have Haley's Comet, um, which is seen much more easily than you can in real life. But it uh, no no one had seen it in 70 years so at the time they made this. So how would they have known how visible it would be? Oh yeah, <laughs> and green too. I don't remember it being green at all. Well, I mean, I would imagine it looks different in space than, you know, from Earth. Hmm, true, true. You know, Good point. The atmosphere. I don't know what it looks like from, from space. I don't think I've ever seen any footage. I mean, I got to see it a little bit like in a, like some binoculars. I, I couldn't see with the naked eye when, when, I, when it was here Back a year nine, after I'm, this like, came out. Okay, I remember, was it then? Because I remember something like back in the 90s there was a thing. Well, okay, that was like was a weird cult comet. Maybe it was, it was a different 80s. comet. Yeah, I saw it a was, bit of it in the nineties. Anyway, if I'm not mistaken, Haley's comet was eighty six, okay. and this was the year before. Makes sense. However, this is obviously some sort of future because, well, or alternate time universe because the UK has a space program. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, guys! Or at least there were a lot of Brits involved. Yeah, uh, it's definitely the UK space program because it's you know the Churchill shuttle. Oh, that's and true. Stuff. That's true. Um, and you know, there's a US space program that where where Columbia is still you know around. Mm. Rest okay. in peace. Um, so the the this UK space program is out exploring the comet before it hits Earth, and they find somehow there's a spaceship hidden in it. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. <laughs> like what a comet is, <laughs> what a Good comet point. does. <laughs> but somehow they put a spaceship inside of it, and uh, when they they decide, hey, let's go and check out this ship, and um, they first find a bunch of, of course, desiccated uh, corpses, and uh, that look like that, that giant bats. And then when they but they find three perfect human specimens just in glass casing and uh well safety precautions who would need to take safety precautions mm -hmm. we're just gonna bring them back to the ship there'd be no movie if they'd followed safety precautions <laughs> very true but i mean come on when you walk through rooms of you know corpses <laughs> and then there's three people that are not corpses in there guess who well, made first, the corpses Right, you have to find out who made the corpses first before bringing the people in good shape back with you. Right. Um, I mean, I guess that there could have still been a movie if they had like possessed one of the astronauts sure. and and you know forced their way onto the ship, hmm. um, and then the ship could have landed in that way. But of course, uh, that doesn't leave us with um, the visuals that were provided <laughs> for what the first half hour of the movie about just about yeah um so one of the specimens i uh well i guess on their home planet they do not have clothes <laughs> and so 
Well, that's yeah. not their true form. True, right. That was the form that they assumed when they scanned the minds of the astronauts. Or forms. Uh, so, uh, she does a bit of a walkabout. <laughs> uh, you know, it, I was trying to look up the episode of Coupling where they talked about this. Oh, yeah, Jenny Hagater. Well... Right, they, they they also talk about Matilda May in that episode, I they believe did. too. I, forgot. I I think yeah, I think there's the whole like <laughs> comparing like movies and you know <laughs> scenes. I did a rewatch of Coupling for the first few seasons earlier in the year. It really doesn't hold up very well. Really, yeah. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, but anyway, uh, so she's of course an easy target, except. She has mind control powers mm. and can pretty much remove the life force from someone from about, what, a few feet away, even? The movie is based on Colin Wilson's 1976 novel, The Space Vampires. Okay, that makes sense. Just to uh, give you an idea of their powers. And so, um, so she, of course, is unstoppable, and it's hence the title of the the show, uh, mm. this episode. Uh, she she's out and about. She isn't looking for a mate, though. She's turns out she's already found one, mm. <laughs> and uh, you know, of course, you know the calls were coming from inside the house. It was the same <laughs> guy in the beginning, but no, I. It's not like that was a spoiler because it's pretty fucking obvious what happened. Well, um, he's, you know, he's some kind of chosen one and he's immune yeah. for some reason and blah, blah, blah. Right. There's a reason an astronaut survived that. Um, he's the only one that survived in the mission mm -hmm. because he, you know, was an escape pod. And uh, which I, I guess no one had thought of escape pods on the shuttle before 85, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, kind of something I wish they had thought of, yeah, yeah. considering what happened after this movie right. and the shuttle. Uh, so, uh, but of course, there was no room for that sort of thing. Anyway, um, so all hell breaks loose. You could almost say literally all hell breaks loose. Yeah. It it is a. Um, it turns into a zombie movie, pretty much. Exactly. I have that in my notes. It's, it suddenly becomes a zombie movie at the end. And, and with a lot of shades of Highlander and Ghostbusters. Right. And uh, I think this is actually the same time as Highlander, isn't it? Year after Ghostbusters. Year after Ghostbusters. Maybe a year before Highlander. I can't remember now. Uh -huh. Maybe Yeah, maybe a year before Highlander. Okay. But Highlander, of course, has you know, everyone's carrying a sword, and you well, know, there's more to Highlander. I was more referring to the, you know, blue lights streaking through the sky. Yeah, I think Highlander did that better, though. Mm. But anyway, mm. <laughs> we have um, less flatulent looking. Yeah, <laughs> we have. Uh, so we have our the guy who you don't really think is going to be the hero is <laughs> kind of running around the city mm -hmm. trying to save the day. And, uh, of course it's the big cathedral where everything is happening, where it's kind of, it's literally ghostbusters. You're right. Where it's like the tall building is used as the antenna mm -hmm. into the sky and Thule and yeah. hilarity ensues. There were two things I remembered going into this. Cause like I said, I haven't seen it in ages. <laughs> I'll say. Oh, Matil well, the uh, Matilda else. May walking around nude, <laughs> and Patrick Stewart. Neither were a thing in the movie for very long. Yeah, um, Pat, this movie needed more Patrick Stewart. <laughs> but I loved the opening music. Just very in all of the music, but it was just very intense. Uh, and the opening narration was an interesting touch because they just tell I you right away, like. We went, you know, we, uh, UK sent a, a ship up to investigate Elias Comet, blah, blah, blah. Sets it up right from the beginning. Well, when you say, speak of score, I mean, a Henry Mancini sci fi score, you know, I didn't look up to see. I think a lot Mancini... of his music was replaced, though. Um, I don't remember who did the music for it. Um, um, I do remember the... reading that his, a lot of his, Mancini's music was replaced. It's kind of, yeah, it does kind of just wind up being a John Williams light mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, apparently there's 
few different versions of this. I didn't realize that until after I'd watched it. So mm. I had watched like an hour and a half version. Oh, wow. I, the one I watched was just shy of two hours. It was. It's also the one that's on Amazon. It's the actual full, full version of the movie. Yeah, I think it was actually an hour and a half now I think about it. Or was it an hour 45? Okay. And I have to reload. <laughs> Mine was uh, an hour 56, just shy of two hours, which is the official running time on Wikipedia. I watched it on uh, I, HBO Max came in handy. Oh, I do. Well, I'm pondering <laughs> trying it again for um, the, the new Lovecraft series. Um, you know, it's... Yeah, it's got some weird things on there, like Turner Classic movies uh-huh. and stuff. Um, I watched Blood Simple on... <laughs> do you know a zombie takeout unrelated movie although i guess cohen's are in a real house we didn't we do what was blood did we do blood simple what was the one with like the old like prohibition era mobster movie we did uh we did miller's crossing Crossing, that's it i I got them confused um anyway as you look that up um i love the organic look of the ship apparently it was based on an artichoke mine was uh 102 minutes Okay. Wow. What? You watched a much shorter version than I did. Yes. <laughs> that explains yes. why I was running late tonight. Um. Also, but but also, I loved the spacewalk because it was so eighties. Um. Yeah. Back when we reviewed one of the Star Trek movies, or, no, it was um the thing. I talked about the blue glow of eighty sci-fi that was all over this thing. <laughs> and and right, there was a lot of blue here. <laughs> and as they're going through the ship. You know, because it is very organic looking. I kind of half expected some kind of giant crab thing to you know grab onto one of their faces. <laughs> Just a little, you know, Geiger action going yeah. on with the. <laughs> um, I thought at the, at first that the giant bats were a nice head fake, because I knew they weren't the vampires, or so I thought. Yeah. <laughs> we find out at the end the giant bats are the true form of the vampires. Right. Which is a little on the nose. <laughs> yes. Very much so. But, very Clash of the Titans looking. Yeah. But I, I think it, well, for a lot of the movie, it does a great job of building suspense. Yeah. It's nice and intense. Um, the movie kind of alternates between re- being really intense and dramatic and being really ridiculous and cheesy. Right. It has really in- seriousness to it. At the same time, though, it has just silly <laughs> absurdities to it you know mm-hmm. i mean the, the the anytime it tries to do action it's kind of like really <laughs> but anytime and, it's doing straight of drama it kind of s- sucks you in i yeah. guess i could say no pun intended and i think it's a lot of their their budget maybe because the effects were mostly pretty cheesy um but also that that sort of mix of cheese and you know intense drama could be explained by this It has been suggested that Life Force was largely a remake of Hammer Film Productions' Quatermass and the Pit. In an interview, director Tobe Hooper, best known for Chainsaw Massacre, um, discussed how Canon Films gave him $25 million, free reign, and Colin Wilson's book, The Space Vampires. Wilson then shares how giddy he was, quote, I thought I'd go back to my roots and make a a 70mm Hammer film. (laughs) <laughs> so he, he basically made a hammer film which again hammer films have that mix of cheese and drama but would it have been better if they had just went you know they had Dykstra for you know I mean he could really do some cool things but it feels like we had a lot of you know Clash of the Titans I love stuff here. that it got that cheesy at spots though it was <laughs> yeah I love that mix um now, of course, when they find, you know, the the bodies on the ship, on the alien ship, they're in these glass cases naked. Um, yes. And they did something that, as, as you pointed out, had to be for ratings. Um, the lower frontal nudity on the male aliens was either strategically blocked or blurred. Definitely not the case with the female alien. Right. Um, had to be a ratings thing. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. You, you couldn't get away with that mm. for long, you know. Yeah. Um, and then they get they show Earth as you know they lost track of the the shuttle, the Churchill. Um, 
And even though the movie was released in 85, it had to have been shot earlier because it got very Planet 70s up in there. <laughs> like, if it was early 80s, I would understand that. But it's it was 85. This was like the beginning of hair metal. Maybe things were different in the UK. Um, well, I noticed that the Columbia still had the blue, or not the blue, the, the white uh, back tank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'm trying to remember when that sort of they were using the rust color for that okay. instead. And I, I think that was around 81, if I'm not mistaken. OK, that makes sense. Then it was, it was shot way earlier, which is why it looks all 70s. At least some oh. of that stuff. I would love to know how legit that giant VHS that they pulled out is, if that's like really a thing that they do on shuttles or not. <laughs> um. And I loved um, Dr. Falada, who ends up being... I didn't remember Dr. Falada, but he ends up being, like, a major thing in the movie. Um, yeah. He points out that he's not qualified to pass judgment on alien death. Loved that line. <laughs> yeah, he is a really unique character because, you know, I guess there's no moral compass there. It's just kind of... Everything's matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's... He he's sort of and it's not science for science's sake. He's not like that kind of character. He yeah. just kind of accepts what's happening and doesn't judge, which is right. fascinating. Um, I also loved his line about how we're all vampires because we all live off of the energy of other creatures. And the the colonel, mm-hmm. um, I really expected him uh, to be, you know, the bad guy or turn mm-hmm. bad or right, something. Right, right. He just had he he just didn't seem like a likable guy. You mean uh, Carlson Rosbach's character, right? Um, the one who no, survived. Uh, uh, oh, that's right. They're both colonels. <laughs> okay, which Peter colonel are you talking about? Kane. Yeah, the one he partnered with for most of the movie. Yeah, um, yeah. he was just kind of the typical prick, um, British prick. He's, he's you know it's a, it's an iconic you know, trope. Um, I didn't necessarily think he was you know, going to be evil. Um, he kind of reminded me of um, the guy from Split Second in the beginning, the British guy. Hmm. Kind of that, that by the book, you know, British cop character. Oh, OK. Uh, you know, but you just kind of saw him selling them out or something like that. You know, you didn't. I was I... kind of waiting for Rosbach's character to, to end up being the bad guy. You know, right. at some point which i mean arguably he kind of sort of was in a way kind of um but the weird thing about this movie is the, the twist is there there are no twists right everybody pretty much is almost everybody is who they say they are right. you know i mean There's we no... we get confirmation that carlson is maybe one of the vampires at the end. I don't know yeah. what, exactly. Was he always one of them? Was he like an advanced scout that they sent? You know, I I don't think so. I think he became one when she he... turned him on the ship on the on the shuttle. Right, right. Okay. It's you know the story of the Lamia. You know where right, right. You're you're feeding them uh-huh. and they're feeding you. Right, right, right. Um, um, and it, and it was all very kind of intense and dramatic. Until the male vampires wake up. And then we got some great gore. Right. Great fake gore. I mean, very cheesy. Not not believable, but like very cheesy like gunshot wounds and fake gore. Um, loved the reanimated corpse of the guard when he wakes back up. Right. You get some of your, your Clash of the Titans. Uh... But it was a really nice design. Uh, he was just, California was just raisin. a desiccated body animated love the design and the effect yeah. um kind of had mixed feelings when she got close um <laughs> you know less eye candy but also less cheese you know I, I, maybe i'd be able to take the movie a bit more seriously ah uh, yeah yeah that is a, a conflicted yeah <laughs> mm. um and and also seeing what happened when the turned guard couldn't feed kind of gave me an idea of like okay that explains the, the bat aliens because they were just kind of desiccated um come to find out no that's that's the original species um yeah and yeah right i guess they they turn humans and humans have to 
they they force the humans into yeah taking life source for themselves and i, and I like that it does commit to the vampire thing because they you know they show the, the people who were sired turning and you know needing to feed and all of that it doesn't shy away from yes this is a vampire movie it's weird though that it would it, it's a space vampire and zombie movie yeah all rolled in one right um <laughs> Then we get the recovering of the escape pod when Carlson's brought back. Nice, very short, but very dramatic, intense scene there. Um, it's weird to see people shaking hands these days. Uh, it's weird hearing someone say, Houston, we have a problem, and it's not uh, a, joke, a joke, and it's yeah, not yeah. Apollo 13. Right. Um, but Lovell did actually say that before Tom X did, so. Right. Um, yeah, that, that that was a quote. that They were referencing the original, not that. No. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm glad we finally saw what actually happened. Well, we get two versions of what happened on the Churchill, but we get something filled in, you know, about half hour in after they rescue Carlson. Because we had no idea before then. I mean, it's kind of, I thought it was kind of obvious, but then, yeah, they bring up the, you know, someone's possessed and destroys equipment and mm-hmm. and then just everyone gets killed by the by the vampire. Right, right, right. Um, it's interesting that he chose to light up the bat alien when he was, you know, burning the ship. I guess it's the driest thing around. It makes sense. It's in the same room as them. Um, seemed an odd choice though. Um, (laughs) now when he has, when he, the sex scene in the movie, was it actually a dream? Do you think, or did she really connect with him? Oh man. And it was so obvious, like. Oh, we're about to have a dream, you know, sequence, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> well, no, it was totally played as a dream, but I think she actually did connect with him. But it's so rare to see a dream sequence set up in the way it is in this movie of like, we've changed the way, you know, the camera perspective, you know, mm-hmm. and focus and he's in bed and it's kind of like, th- there is no like, is this real or not? Like, you know, it's a dream going in, which... I Which mean, begs the question of was it? You know. Well, it's if it's happening in your mind, is it re- is it real or not? That's yeah, that's fair. I, I the the question, you know, was it a product of his mind or her connecting to his mind? Oh, it's definitely her connecting yeah. to to his mind. I, I would think so too. Um, but that's I think the most refreshing thing about this movie. It has absolutely no pretense. Right. There's. Well, there's kind of this I'm trying to think if the, if it's intentional or not that that you know is he are they really telling a story about libido and and you know mm-hmm. being beholden to it and, and not having your free will you know is that I mean is that any vampire story of course well, that's, that's every vampire story yeah, yeah. <laughs> that and infectious disease which is what vampires are really about. Um, you know, as soon as we can make movies again, there's going to be a slew of vampire and zombie movies. Mark my words. Oh, really? I don't know. That's what it's about, man. Do people really want to see it after living it, though? I mean... It's, it's, the whole purpose of those stories is to talk about what we're living through now. So I, I, I think it's going to happen. It's kind of like how Emmerich movies went out after 9-11. It was like, okay, yeah. we've seen the buildings crash. We... We really don't need to see it again, dude. Mm-hmm. True. Well, yeah, when you've seen it in reality. But I, I think there's going to be a lot of things that need to be excised from people's heads, and they're going to come out in the form of vampire and zombie movies after this. Um, now, making Carlson immune to the vampires kind of feels like a cheat. <laughs> but I think it works for the plot. Well, right, because if he's one of them... You know, they wouldn't, I, I guess they can't really go after it. Like, they can right. go after her. <laughs> and, and it doesn't make him the target on the run from them, which would have been even more cliche than the movie was. Well, how about the whole, uh, towards the end, where they actually had a path laid out for him right. of the bodies? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's clearly, the you know, being enlisted. He's being brought in so he can, yeah. you know... M- m- uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Con Congress with her, and and you know, bring for help, you know, to to bring the energy back to the ship or something. Um, there was one thing that did kind of surprise me. 
um, the alien being in Armstrong, Pat- Patrick Stewart's character. I didn't oh, expect yeah. That. that was that was a... Uh, and yeah, it was such a quick switch, too, that you're like, wait, what? What's going mm-hmm. on here? <laughs> and my, I see, uh, my version had the kiss cut. Oh! Um, yeah, okay. Um, it was actually Patrick Stewart's first on-screen kiss. And it was with Steve <laughs> Rails back in this movie. Yeah, you do not see them kiss in my version, the HBO oh, wow. Max version. Um, it was they didn't show much in the version I saw. It was just like a blink and you'll miss it contact. Um, just enough to, to let you know that's what happened. Like their heads come together, kind of, but they they don't show them coming together. You, right. You just you infer. Mm-hmm. I think you see him kissing her instead, actually. Oh wow. Well, they do kind of shift between the two. Right. Um, for a while there. Um, loved the sort of up-facing angles when they were discussing giving him another dose, though. Very Hammer. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the steak uh, Falada used to kill one of the male vampires. I want that. <laughs> it's this ornate, you know, leather-handled iron and... Was it, was it leaded iron steak? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Looks like a, looks like this very ornate sword. Loved it. Um, and staking them in the energy center right beneath the heart was yeah. great. It's it's sort of like where one of the chakras supposedly is. That was right. a really nice touch. Um, and the cheesy as fuck blood vomit in the helicopter. <laughs> the 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 blood that forms her. Yeah, yeah. These two, you know, victims who had died. Uh, victims of the vampires who had been infested by them on the helicopter. Rookie mistake. Um, right. Blood starts flowing out of their mouths and noses and congeals together. Kind of forms a heart at first, and then that turns into her. Probably the best effect in the whole movie, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, and his flashback to opening, you know, the case and he, what actually happened on the on the ship on the Churchill really reminded me of the Tom Waits story. Oh, <laughs> she did the same thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Rollins, Tom Waits story. Look it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then we get to the plagues in London, which is like, you know, one of my perspective titles sums it up best. Romero's Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, I love the, the scene where they're driving through and they pretty much just have this thing of flame. Someone screaming flames. <laughs> <Someone's> screaming. <Yeah. laughs> I half I I half expected to hear. I believe it's magic. I uh, a lot of those scenes I was expecting to see thriller play through oh, yeah, or yeah. something, um, but also I was expecting someone running through the crowd yelling, "It's a cookbook! <laughs> it's a cookbook!" Yes, yes. Um, also, when Kane and Carlson went to see the prime minister, and he got turned. It's very I, Monty Python. <laughs> I, I love how they just like noped out, just like yes. very casually. <laughs> and we're done here. <laughs> but yeah, it's very Python, very like, uh, ah, you know, can, can I see you back here for a moment? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, which one of them was the vampire in that scene? Oh, the prime minister. He was, and he was turning her. Okay, I wasn't because I mean. I they I think they were pretty obvious about it because he was like wiping like like the from his mouth. Mm-hmm. True, yeah. <laughs> and just like all sweaty and just yeah. But there was no shock on their face, no like, oh my god, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do? They just turned around and noped out. Yeah, it's time to yeah, time to get out of here. <laughs> and at first I thought the spread of the virus in London, the the you know, the the plague as they called it. Yeah. was too sudden, but then I thought, okay, feral vampirism would spread that quickly in a major city. Yeah. You know, it's like zombie and zombie outbreak. It would spread that quickly. It's kind of like why in mid-March we were like oh, yeah, really on edge here. Not to bring it back to this. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's exactly why I think that people aren't going to want to see these kinds of movies when, when we're done with this. It's a question. A lot of them are going to be written and and pitched. Yeah. It's a question of whether they got they get greenlit. Um, you know, it's a question of whether the the 
think studio executives think there's money um, because a lot of them are being written right now. I would bet that. So uh, were you okay with the love story in this one? <laughs> yeah, because it was kind of destructive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like the typical romantic subplot. Um, and it was all about being... It, well, he wasn't in love. <laughs> he was a ghoul. He was thralled. I, I thought the whispering of his name was a bit on the nose. I think we could have lived without that. He was a sexualized Renfield. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it wasn't like a normal love story. I, I like that. Um, also liked the explanation of that how they're collecting the energy. It's always get I always enjoy getting a bit of good full bottom. Um, and one of them at one point, um, they're he's telling someone, you know, if we find the source, we won't have to destroy London. I think Kane said that, and then and one of the generals said, but we only have an hour and a half, like. <laughs> we don't have time to save the city like not like go try but we'll have to do that make a move in an hour and a half he's but we only have an hour and a half <laughs> i yeah that probably would have been the best ending of this is like they save the day and then the bomb goes and off yeah, anyway they, they bake on anyway <laughs> um, fuck this we're not taking any chances you guys are all toast and i liked how gradually they gave away that falado was turned Hmm. Yeah, well, you, you don't expect him to get turned. Uh, he's he did? kind of there in the dark, you know. Well, when you get to that scene, you're like, wait, what's up? And they give it away kind of little by little. But you, he's not someone you expect from the beginning. You kind of expect something bad to happen with him. Like, again, he, he's another guy you think is going to be a bad guy, which is really the weird thing about this movie or who the good guys, the bad guys, you, you, you kind of feel they should be the other way around almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that makes it interesting. Right. Right. Um, oh, by the way, one of the male vampires was played by Chris Jagger, younger brother of Mick Jagger. I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah. There's a bit of a resemblance. And at, at the very end, I realized what the ship remind the alien ship reminded me of. Do you remember Lex? Vaguely. The sci-fi series Siffy. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, we were still I the sci-fi channel, maybe. Um, about a, an organic ship. Um, really fun series. Kind of very very weird. Uh, highly recommend checking out it out if you can find it. But the ship reminded me a lot of the Lex. I just thought it was an umbrella. Mm, yeah. Or an artichoke. Sequel and remakes. Sequels and remakes. Oh, it doesn't really need a sequel or a remake because we got everything we need in the story. Yeah, um, but you know what? Or a sequel have... or a prequel, I should say, because we got everything They've... in the story. In the story, they um, definitely have a prequel set up. This, especially because they said the line, "This isn't the first time they've done this." Oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um. So there's a remake. Uh, I don't know. In the right hands, but I don't know who could really mix that cheese and drama as well as it was done in this movie. There would be a lot of CGI instead. Yeah. Nah, forget it. Leave it. It was, you know. I think there was a remake, actually. Wasn't it called Species? <laughs> fair point, fair point. Um, on the brain? <laughs> on the brains. I love it. It, it. Like I said, it's it's just this amazing mix of intense British drama and absolute fucking ridiculous cheese. I I go. I'm going five. Uh, I think I'm gonna recommend it, but I mean, I, it's definitely not a work of perfection. I'm gonna recommend it though because it's it's interesting, and I think there's a lot to talk about. For mm -hmm. it, so I'm going for. All right, and what have we learned? Uh, that um. <laughs> that a light coming out of the, your your backside can um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Where's the light force things. exiting from? <laughs> yeah, I learned a couple of things. Um, I learned that space isn't as cold as they lead you to believe. <laughs> yeah, she didn't look cold at all. And that some ways to die are better than others. And uh, I mean, she broke all that glass, and none of it cut her feet somehow. Hmm. She actually did have um like pads glued to the back the bottom the soles of her feet. Right. 
well, she, yeah, she would have had to have as an the actress, actress the a human actress. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I guess her feet could regenerate, maybe? I don't mm. know. She's a vampire. Um, yeah. All right, that's it for Life, t- Life Force. Until, I say I almost said Lifetime. Um, until <laughs> next time, we'll be reviewing Reign of Fire, kind of starting a fantasy trilogy of sorts. It's Reign of Fire, Lady Hawk, and Labyrinth. Um, Reign, of, Reign, of, Reign of Fire is a little more sci-fi, though. It feels um, like this kind of uh, kicks it off already, though. Yeah, kind of. Um, and Reign of Fire, uh, un- unintentionally very timely. It's about um, ve- uh, dragons being found um, in an attempt to expand the London Underground in 2020. Oh, oh It's set wow. in 2020. I just found that out. Anyway, until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. There you are. I accidentally clicked, so I'm recording. Pirate will. Oh, all right. Are we are we testing or recording? Oh, I recording? didn't even I didn't test. This is live. Oh. Um, we're ready to go. <laughs> Pirate will. Oh, we're on now. <laughs> this is gonna be some sort of outtake or something. Totally forgot right. to test. All right, I'll I'll go.